Proxmox and Big Little CPU Architecture. Was I right to say it didn't work? Was I wrong to say it didn't work? Well, as with all things, the truth is somewhere in the middle. I think I figured it out though. Let's talk about it. Today's video is brought to you by NordPass. Are you tired of memorizing hundreds of account names and passwords? Worried someone will discover your super secret password list? Do you have credentials you need to share with friends or colleagues? Stop saving everything to an online document and switch to NordPass. With NordPass, you can generate and store secure passwords for every account you own. And it will even make sure you're not using the same password twice. There are desktop, mobile, and web applications for every platform, making it simple to access your passwords no matter which device or operating systems you prefer. If you've been hesitant to use a password manager because of security concerns, NordPass has a zero-knowledge architecture, meaning your data is encrypted and you have the only key to unlock it. But don't take their word for it. NordPass recently passed an AICPA SOC Type 2 security evaluation, meaning they've implemented proper security practices to ensure the privacy of customer data. Stop reusing insecure passwords or keeping them written down in plain text. Visit nordpass.com slash craft to get exclusive access to NordPass's best offers. It's risk-free and comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, that's nordpass.com slash craft and a huge thanks to NordPass for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So, Proxmox and Big Little Architecture. Apparently we have some more to talk about. If you didn't watch the last video, I would encourage you to go do so. Or not, because here's a quick recap. Intel's Alder and Raptor Lake CPUs have two different types of cores, which Intel is calling performance cores and efficiency cores. P cores, as we'll call them from here on out, are traditional CPU cores. These Raptor Cove-based cores can clock to speeds well over 4.5 gigahertz in most cases, and they're hyper-threaded, meaning that each CPU is split into two individual CPU threads. E cores, on the other hand, have a slightly cut down feature set. On the 13900K, for example, each group of four efficiency cores will share four megabytes of L2 cache as well as three megabytes of L3. The cores themselves are also based on Gracemont architecture, the same architecture that powers Intel's Atom and N100 CPUs. Clock speeds are limited to around 3.6 gigahertz on all SKUs, but that still makes them faster at the same clock speed than Intel's 11th gen Rocket Lake CPUs, so these aren't exactly slow. Each E-Core is also single-threaded, meaning you only get one core and one thread per efficiency core. This blending of CPU architectures in a single system is not a new concept, with ARM having mixed core types for nearly a decade now. But bringing that tech to desktop, server, and virtualization is relatively fresh in the x86 space. As such, big names like VMware and Zen have offered zero support for running Intel's hybrid CPUs, and the recommendation for customers is to just turn off the efficiency cores. But the Linux kernel itself does support Intel's non-unified cores and can dynamically allocate core types to workloads on the fly. And in theory, so can hypervisors that rely on the Linux kernel CPU scheduler, hypervisors like Proxmox and KVM. My first attempt at this didn't go so well. See my previous video. On both an Intel engineering sample 12900H and a retail 13620H CPU, I ran into stability issues galore. But after more than 30 hours spent testing, tweaking, experimenting, researching, and testing again, my conclusion was that when it works, it has some major advantages over CPUs with fewer cores. But it's hard to recommend running a virtualization server that hard crashes about every 40 minutes. I received a ton of great feedback and advice after that video went live, including multiple Proxmox devs reaching out with suggestions. So shout out to both Dominique and Dot Bauer in the comment section. In the end, I received a very nice write-up explaining some possible issues surrounding microcode differences between desktop and the mobile CPUs that I was attempting to use, what might be causing the stability issues, and more importantly, how to fix them. Intel's GitHub page has a release for 12th and 13th gen microcode for Linux, which when applied, updates how the Linux kernel interacts with these two different CPU types, that is P cores and E cores. So I figured I would give this one last gasp and applied the microcode patch and got back to testing, starting with the i9-12900HES, along with a fresh install of Proxmox 8.1 running on kernel 6.5 there was an immediate difference, as when I was running the test without the patch applied, even the Windows installer would occasionally crash on me. 
This time I was able to create four VMs, install Windows Server 2022 on each, and get them up and running without a single issue. Again, the i9-12900H engineering sample I'm running is a 14-core, 20-threaded chip with six performance cores and 12 threads, along with an additional eight efficiency cores, and totally not an official way to run this CPU, given that it's on an Earying desktop motherboard. The four virtual machines I set up have four threads assigned to them, and I'm relying on Linux to balance performance between them. I started off my testing nice and easy, just to validate that things were working. I launched a single virtual machine and ran through Cinebench R15, again, an application that isn't aware of hybrid architectures. So if any performance balancing is done in the VMs, it's gonna happen at the host level, not inside the virtual machine itself. I configured and tested this VM a couple of different ways. First off, I loaded it up with a pair of performance cores, essentially giving it two cores and four threads to work with. In a subsequent test, I locked it down to just four efficiency cores. Both of these tests were designed to find what the theoretical max performance of both core types would be. With only four threads, we get a multi-threaded score in Cinebench of 536 using the performance cores and 464 using the efficiency cores. Likewise, single-threaded testing gave us a score of 203, with the E cores lagging significantly behind, managing just 132. Bumming up the test to four virtual machines, we get an average of 323 points per VM, or a combined score of around 1,280, which is just slightly behind our theoretical max of 1,350 on this CPU when we take thermal and power headroom into account. What that means is Linux scheduling and load balancing is working as intended because the load was perfectly balanced across all four VMs. I ran the multi-threaded test a couple more times and saw nearly identical results each and every time. And the best news is thus far, I've had zero stability issues whatsoever with the new patch applied. So I moved on to simultaneous single-threaded testing where we made it about halfway through before yet again, all four VMs crashed and the PC rebooted. But everything started right back up and single-threaded testing in Cinebench shows the four VMs scoring a 175, a 175, a 175, and a 172 around 14% slower than the solo run with dedicated P cores, but still 32% faster than when running with efficiency cores alone. During testing in the previous video, crashes would happen within 10 minutes of getting all four virtual machines booted up. Yet this time I was able to go through four Windows OS installs, multiple rounds of testing before even a single lockup. In fact, over two days of testing, I only experienced two crashes in total with this motherboard versus easily a dozen or more times without the microcode update applied. It's still not enough of an improvement for me to call the 12900ES stable to use in virtualization, but it's a massive improvement nonetheless. But what about a retail CPU? Let's switch gears over to the i7-13620H with its six performance cores and four efficiency cores. Did the new microcode update make virtualization a viable option for this hybrid CPU? In a word, yes. Again, we're really looking for stability above all else, but just like the last video, I'm curious at how well performance can balance across four VMs with the Linux kernel running the show, or if there's any benefit at all to locking in certain core types to manually manage performance settings. Again, starting with a sanity check, I've got a single virtual machine set up and have the CPU affinity assigned manually. When running with only performance cores, we get a multi-threaded score of 695 and a very impressive single-threaded result of 263. When locked down to running only four efficiency cores, we see a multi-threaded score of 625 and a single-threaded score of just 166. And this lines up with some testing that I've done with P and E core performance for Raptor Lake CPUs in the past. A single performance core thread is faster than a single efficiency core thread. That shouldn't surprise anyone but it gets a little cloudy once you add a second thread to the equation. Let's say a P core is our baseline and an efficiency core is around 60% as fast. In single threaded applications, the P core will obviously win and by a very wide margin. But when two CPU threads are involved, the efficiency core gets an entire second CPU where the P core is hyper-threaded and now splits instructions essentially with its own resources. That second thread, at least in AVX workloads like Cinebench, is only around 40% as fast as the single core by itself. That means you wind up with very similar performance between core types when two threads are needed. And it's for this reason that I was so critical of Intel removing efficiency cores from their new Xeon chips, because it obviously tanks the multi-threaded performance potential of these CPUs in a server environment. 
That is, assuming you have software that you're capable of running to take advantage of two different core types. But that's why I'm doing this testing and making these videos. With our baseline performance established, let's see how well Proxmox balances the workload with four VMs running at the same time. Again, each VM is set up with four CPU threads, and the Linux kernel will need to balance the workload in the background. In this scenario, we see a multi-threaded score average of 588. That is lower than both the isolated P-Core and E-Core tests, but keep in mind we're running into the power limit on the CPU, so clock speeds were slightly slower with all the threads being hit at once. Still, we're only 6% slower than the E-Core isolated test with all four virtual machines running, and the difference between the top and bottom performing VM was just 3%. Balanced performance thanks to CPU scheduling by the Linux host. You love to see it. Single-threaded tests were even more impressive, with an average of 237 points and a point spread of only 2.5%. The average result was slower than a single P-Core by itself, but still 42% faster than running a single-threaded test on an E-Core. Seeing performance dynamically shift is a ton of fun, but one thing I've been really curious about is what happens if you lock down a virtual machine to only using P or E-Cores and you load the entire CPU up at once. Say you had a VM like Pi-Hole. It doesn't need access to P-Cores pretty much ever. Or what if you're running a game server and you only want that using performance cores? What performance differences are you likely to see? Well, the results aren't terrific. With VM number one locked down to only using efficiency cores, we do see single thread performance slow to just 153 points. Interestingly though, the other three VMs also saw a dip in performance with an average of just 223 falling by around 6%. Multi-threaded performance dropped to 540 and we saw a slight bump in the other three VMs to an average of 624. Some interesting results to say the least. Switching gears and locking the VM down to cores zero through three, that is two P cores and four threads, we see virtually no difference from having the affinity just be unbound. While VM number one does score higher than the other three in both single and multi-threaded testing, the multi-threaded test is within the margin of error, and as such, isn't really a conclusive result. Single-thread performance, we do see a score of 249. Still not quite as good as the solo test result of 263, but only around 4% faster than the automatically scheduled VMs. And that's where I thought this video and this story was going to end. I finally got some stable performance and balancing inside of VMs, and we get to take advantage of more cores and more threads over non-hybrid CPUs. As a definitive stability test, I did run Cinebench R23's 30-minute stress test about a dozen times over the next day. And in all my testing, the 13620H on this Erying motherboard never experienced a single crash, so I think it's stability issues solved. But then, Something really odd happened when I was validating my results. When I was doing my original P versus E core benchmarks, I had locked down a single VM to only using four threads. That is cores zero through three for two cores and four threads of P cores and cores 12 through 15 for four efficiency cores during testing. Those tests were done with a single VM running to ensure I wouldn't run into some power or performance limit caused by other processes. With four VMs up and running and no CPU affinity to find on any of them, I hit run on the multi-threaded test for Cinebench R15 on a single VM. And I got a multi-threaded result of 1033. That's 48% faster than my single VM running with nothing but performance cores. That's nearly four times faster than my fastest single-threaded score of 263. So I ran it again and again. I ran multiple times through this and got similar results each and every time. I also ran two VMs and got scores of 837 and 986. Again, both of them an order of magnitude faster than my P-Core isolated test. How? Well, let's rewind the tape just a little bit. Remember my comments about the difference between P-Core and E-Core performance? A P-Core in a two-threaded scenario is massively limited by the speed of its second thread. But what if we didn't use the second thread in a P-Core and instead we gave it another P-Core? Because the Linux kernel is balancing the workload across threads, it doesn't care if that second thread is the P-Core's hyper thread or an efficiency core or another P-Core. It's gonna send the load to whichever thread can crunch those numbers the fastest. 
That means with the Linux host balancing the load automatically, it might actually net you more performance per thread than if you locked down a single VM to only a single CPU type. Whereas on bare metal, when you load up a single performance core and then ask a second thread from the same task, it'll load up that performance core's thread. Now the Linux host can just throw another performance core at it and pretend it's not a hyper-threaded machine. It doesn't have to be locked in with its slower thread type. And when the server is under enough load, it'll just balance the performance across all its thread types anyway. I was not expecting to come away from this video with an example of boosting multi-threaded performance by 50% by running a task in a VM instead of on bare metal. But those are the results that I came up with. It makes me want to try this out on a 13900K now and see how far we can take performance balancing when we don't have to worry about silly things like a 75 watt power limit or having only 16 threads available. So I guess stay tuned for part three in this series. As far as where I'm going to leave you with this video, what I can say in my testing of these two motherboards that I bought specifically for home lab use is stay away from the engineering sample boards if you're looking to do some of this type of work. Now, I run a number of engineering sample CPUs, specifically my Tiger Lake boards from Erying in my server rack, and they have been remarkably stable. But when we're working with new kernel scheduling and power balancing and load balancing, this one still had some stability issues to work through. And as such, I just can't recommend it, let alone the PCI Express issues that I explained in the last video. When it comes to these mobile retail CPU chips though, with the right microcode applied, which is available directly from Proxmox, and I will give full links down in the video description to let you know how to install all this, this ran perfectly fine over three plus days of testing with some very intensive loads going on with every single thread available to the CPU pegged to the max. I think it is totally a viable option to use Intel's hybrid architecture now inside of Proxmox to the naysay of many commenters in my Xeon E2400 series video. I can't wait to see what can of worms this particular video opens up, so please sound off in the comment section below about your experiences using Intel's hybrid system inside of virtualization. I'm also gonna be thrilled to find out if some of you have been configuring your systems wrong now that dynamic load balancing is a thing inside of the Linux kernel. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on social media at Craft Computing. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support more of these weird and wacky projects, go over to craftcomputing.store, pick yourself up a pint glass or a coffee tumbler, and start drinking like a pro. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Beer for today is from Freem over in Hood River, Oregon. This is the Extra Pale IPA, clocking in at 6.5%. And holding this beer today is my Code Rain glass from over on craftcomputing.store. Those both look good. I got all the way through this video and forgot to review the beer simply because I was enjoying it too much. I would take a drink and go, oh, that's really nice, and then just get back to talking. So Freem's Extra Pale, fruity scents of melon and pineapple and the juicy essence of strawberry and gooseberry makes Freem Extra Pale Ale taste great but it's the big hoppy aroma and full flavor that makes it extra. Well, let's test all that, shall we? For as much citrus and fruit as in this, it's got a very floral aroma to it. It might put some people off that it doesn't quite match from one to the other. So a little bit floral on the nose, maybe a little melon in there, a little bit of melon. As far as the flavor goes, they mentioned pineapple. I don't get any pineapple. It is very fruity though, but it's very fruity and like a dark, rich fruit. Um, I don't get strawberry. I get like strawberry rhubarb. I don't get melon or honeydew. I get cantaloupe. Uh, it's that darker cousin to that, that fruity flavor. Very rich, very big bodied. It's just extra good.